I'm gonna assume pretty much everyone watching this video has played some game hosted on Itch.io at one point or another, by far the most friendly platform for indie developers these days. Started by Leaf Corcoran as a way to organize his Game Jam games, before quickly turning into a low-friction home for everything from the mundane to the quirky, it's a stark contrast to the fees and restrictions of Steam that lead to countless titles being rejected and developers deplatformed. The creative freedom opened up by that leads to a charm that I adore, the feeling that these smaller games I'm playing are made out of passion and love unhampered by worries of being rejected, often expressing some sort of sentiment over the course of 10 to 100 minutes that many mainstream games can't hope to even match in 100 hours, made on the budget of a can of beans and some shoestrings. While a lot of what comes out of that is just small little tech demos and neat oddities, you also get a lot of resonant and meaningful works of art that couldn't exist elsewhere. That's not even mentioning that, most relevant to my interests, the English original language visual novel and edige scene primarily exists on there due to Steam being miserably horrible to anything that isn't family safe. Fun for the whole polycule! Something I wondered recently, however, is what platform had all these qualities back in the 90s? Where could you go to get weird, artsy, offbeat, memorable experiences sandwiched between countless other titles? What platform was free of restrictions and fees as low as can be? What had the spirit of itch.io in the 90s? And to that question, I found an answer probably nobody else has. It's the Freedio, specifically in Japan. A failure by all financial definitions, the console conceived by former Electronic Arts CEO Trip Hawkins and designed by Commodore engineers known for their work on the Amiga, did not do well in any country released in, selling a total of 1 million units worldwide. And on a gaming side, English-speaking retro gamers will probably be quick to tell you the console is nothing to get excited about, with a purely mediocre library of games and hardware unfit to keep up with Sony's monstrously successful PlayStation and Sega's cult classic Saturn. First off, I can test the fuck out of those statements, but secondly, English-speaking are the two key keywords, because something people often forget when discussing the Freedio is the console didn't just exist in North America and Europe. It had a whole life of its own in Japan, with numerous localizations, ports from home computers, and over 100 games we never saw here, many of which are just as bizarre, quirky, and fascinating as what you see now on sites like Itch.io. And I think the reason for why there's such a high density of fuckliness here are varied and complex. On a hardware side, it had impressive FMV playback capabilities, and was the first consumer system to be built with 3D capabilities in mind, alongside being one of the first exclusively CD systems after Philips and Commodore's attempts were complete busts. On a marketing side, the system had huge investor support and a hell of a lot of hype. And on the developer side, the Freedio company's philosophy was much more like that of Ichio now. They aimed to give people the freedom to enter the marketplace without inhibiting creativity, and charge an absurdly low licensing fee of only $3 per game. That was all a very stark contrast to Sega and Nintendo's policies. To quote Kenji Eno of D-Fame, When I first established Warp, I went to Freedio, and that was right around the time that Freedio opened their Japanese branch. And Freedio Japan was very nice to me. And they were telling me, you can become a publisher whenever you want. And back in the day, to make a game for Nintendo, it was very difficult because the cartridges were expensive. It cost something like 1,000 yen up front for each unit made, so it was too difficult for me to do. And Freedio's licensing fee was very reasonable. To add on to this freedom, a factor that's often understated is that the Freedio isn't just a games platform, it's meant to be an interactive multiplayer, a more sophisticated device for a more sophisticated era. The era of multimedia. Freedio was meant to be a place where, sure, you could get games, but you could also get art, music, movies, education, and interactive experiences that blurred the lines between all of those. Perhaps because of all these factors combined, the Freedio found a niche in both the US and Japan as a platform of complete freedom, but the latter more so than anywhere else. It became a home for people who fancied themselves a tours like Eno, and anyone else who wanted to experiment with things they couldn't do elsewhere, all with a distinctly different vibe from any other platform due to the mixed-media nature of the system, combined with greater power than other systems and many home computers. Really, the only thing that's even vaguely close in terms of vibes is a Macintosh, which got some of those similar artsy experimental feelings going on, though that's mainly in the realm of point-to-click adventures due to the slow Motorola 68K CPUs that Apple used in their computers up till the latter half of the 90s. Freedio got more variety than that thanks to the hardware actually being made to handle sprites, FMV, and 3D, courtesy of an ARM CPU, free combined megabytes of RAM, dual proprietary graphics processors, and Dolby surround sound capable sound processor. It's a different skill from the PSX or Saturn, but in raw power beat the hell out of any console released up to that point, lending the platform its own unique aesthetic and feel that isn't matched by other consoles. And that extends out to the physical look of the system too, being decidedly different from anything else at the time, at least depending on the variety you got. 
Since Fridio was an architecture that companies could license and not one specific console, everyone had their own spin on it. You got LG's first take on the Gold Star Fridio with its weirdly chunky look, the Sanyo Tri that looks like an early 2000s DVD player, the cost-reduced Panasonic FC10 that looks like an average CD game system, and the OG that I have here, the Panasonic FZ1, which goes for a 90s premium hi-fi aesthetic a la Laserdisc or SVHS player, be fitting of the 700 goddamn USD price tag it had during the first few months of its life. It's a pretty durable system, feeling hefty and like it could take a few hits without flinching, though I'm obviously not gonna test that. It's solid internally too, with the only major faults these days being dead capacitors, as expected from a lot of old tech, and disk drive failure, which I had to work around through the wonderful world of drive emulators. Case in point, this thing is decked out with Fixel's FZ1 ODE, which supports the full library of games in various CD-ROM image formats via SD and USB storage, allows for reading at the absolute max speed the system can handle, and makes the console totally silent. You can even set custom wallpapers with a little bit of trickery and some dev tools. Of course, stuff like this comes at a price and the ODE retails for 250 USD. I definitely think it's worth the cash, but it's not something I can imagine a lot of people being able to afford. I absolutely would not have been able to were it not for people being generous on my birthday back in January. Shoutouts to everyone who sent even a buck that day. Y'all are awesome and this video would not have happened without you. Nor have any other future ones really, since alongside this thing I got a whole bunch of games I intend to cover at some point in the future. So, what does all of this put together give you? Besides a status symbol that's guaranteed to impress anyone who comes over to your place, you get the unmoderated keys to classic gems such as the Life Stage Virtual House. Developed by Microcabin, one of those developers who originated from the Wild West world of Japanese PC game development, it's a room building and exploration simulator created explicitly to contrast with the kinds of action games that were popular at the time. In an interview with the official Japanese Fridio magazine, one of the leads talks about wanting to create a slower and more deliberate experience, one intended for calm, long play, as opposed to the short bursts of dopamine that 3D games all about shooting things provided. And as a result, we got this, a game that quite accurately simulates the feeling of exploring a house you don't own. I'm pretty sure that wasn't the exact intention, but during my entire time playing I couldn't help remember all the time I spent exploring homes of my family. Never quite satisfied of where we were living, I got to see a whole ton of places. Some empty, recent developments filled with placeholder ornaments and niceties to make it seem lively, and others in the process of being vacated, filled with personal belongings and memories. All of them were quiet and uncomfortable in their stillness, filled of objects one is forbidden from interacting with in rooms that logically connect yet feel unfamiliar to the one intruding. Vast spaces that should be busy and populated but are instead silent, tense, and lifeless. The reason for this vibe is a lot of things, but the most crucial is the presentation. The 3 is a capable system, but not exactly a god-tier powerhouse, with 3D titles seemingly needing some great optimization to hit greater than something like 15 FPS on average. And life stage is, well, far from optimized. The game regularly dips below 10 frames per second, sometimes feeling like it's running at 4 or so, resulting in controls that feel uncontrollable, and a world that seems to be tearing at itself with slowdown and texture warping. Adding on to this, the whole game's got an aggressively crispy low fidelity look, perhaps in an attempt to squeeze whatever small bits of performance they could from their code. Rooms are limited to having simple and basic geometry, objects are a mixture of hyper-compressed real-life 2D photos and simple 3D shapes stuck together, and every texture is crunched to a truly impressive degree. Put that together with the lack of audio besides object interactions and room changes, and you got all those aforementioned discomforting vibes and then some, topped with a feeling of voyeurism as you peer through these new virtual spaces, clicking on and touching every single thing in hopes of some life and a life with space, only to be constantly rejected by the only interactable things being telephones, stereos, and TVs where you can watch Shark. If I had to compare it against anything I've played from recent years, it would probably be Alien Melon's Terra Getting Games. It's a compilation of various games, web pages, and other oddities harkening back to an era of Flash. And there's no particular meaning to many of them, no grander goals, no overarching story, only a collection of assorted worlds that channel a number of feelings. Nostalgia, discomfort, joy, confusion, all without any real resolution. A life stage similarly embodies all of those feelings and lacks the horror twist of other Ichio games like No Players Online and Pagan Otengeny. 
both of those purposefully leaning into the feeling of peering into empty, lifeless spaces, specifically empty multiplayer environments. The ambitions to make you cry or hide in a corner aren't here, as the game is upfront with what it is with you, a bunch of pointless rooms with total freedom to explore them. Nothing is coming to get you, but unlike something like The Sims or Build Mode in Minecraft, you have no ownership nor control over these places. You're merely a specter floating through them and enjoying the sights. At least as much as the clumsy feeling of the controls allows you to. The actual usage of the buttons feels fine, D-pad to move, shoulder buttons to turn, B to pull up a cursor, A to interact, and C to look in all directions. But there's all sorts of quirks to how this all plays out. There's almost no vertical movement aside from your character gravitating towards and clinging onto stairs when near them, running can only be accomplished by holding forwards down, and every action you take feels delayed by an incredible amount of time, even with the game running as theoretically fast as it can on real hardware. In some ways, the clunk adds to that feeling of liminality and outsideness, making you feel even more powerless to the forces that govern this foreign world. If fighting with stairs for a minute straight while the game seems to disrespect every single one of your inputs, struggling to move around objects with way too fucking big hitboxes, and learning to use the mechanic of clicking on doors to wiggle around blockages. If this were a game that required split-second reaction times and careful exploration to win, then I'd probably be more upset, but this ain't that. This is chill relaxing. Vibes, even. At least for most of the sample world, since two of the eight are built far more around unnerving the player in some ways that feel both laughably dated and surprisingly effective. Particularly, the mystery world is this realm of highly disconnected spaces that have nothing to do with one another, having a sort of dreamlike quality in their senselessness. It's a good showcase for how much the engine can do, as well as a good way to give players ideas on what to make in this surprisingly intuitive editor. Placing rooms, decorating them, picking out the walls and such, it's all easy to navigate and enjoyable to toy with in a way not to similar to the aforementioned Sims and Minecraft building modes years and years afterwards. Life Stage is, by far, the weirdest game out of Microcabin's whole 3 do output, which is to imply they had a surprisingly strong presence on the console, publishing and or developing seven different games in a variety of genres. Probably best known as their port of Puzzle Bobble, but they're also the ones who brought Mist over from the Macintosh onto the platform and published it in Japan, as well as a surprisingly great port of Princess Maker 2 that not many people talk about. I've really considered covering this series for a while, and playing the most famous entry for the first time here made me give that a lot more serious thought. It's a great raising sim with some banger music, cute graphics, fun gameplay, and a lot of personality, enhanced by this port adding voice acting to the original release, as well as fancy high-res, high-detail graphics. Which, uh, kinda look worse than the PC-98 pixel art, but stuff like this was considered cutting edge for a time. It's not just a free do thing, you can find it all over PC-98 ports on the Saturn, PSX, and especially NEC's PCFX system, with devs on all being equally hungry to take advantage of the ability to display over 32 thousand simultaneous colors for highly detailed images, despite the fact that the 240p or lower resolution often made these images look very crunchy. It's a unique aesthetic all its own that I've really grown to appreciate though, and one that the system provides in spades with the surprising amount of Japanese PC ports on here. I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention Konami's Police Knots here, this being the first home console port of the game and the first version to have subtitles since Kojima forgot deaf people existed for a time. It's also one of the better versions, beating out the PSX with more content and higher frame rate video, but still lesser than the Saturn ports that added light gun support and more story content. Koei is another big Japanese dev that got a slice of the 3DO port pie too, bringing entries in both the famous Nobunaga's Ambition and the Romance of the Free Kingdom strategy series over with animated cutscenes, new artwork, and soundtracks taking advantage of the high quality Redbook audio capabilities of the CD format. Kind of surprisingly to me, Angelique didn't get a port to the platform despite being slapped on PS1 and Saturn and being of the same Koei strategy kin. Just simplified for a young girl's audience and beautified with pretty anime boys, which is the only way my peanut brain can comprehend a strategy game like this. So though, Koei did seem to have a fondness for the platform given they released four more games besides these. They got one of their horse racing games brought over, and additionally the entire Amit trilogy of bilingual English learning visual novels. VNs are normally my jam, they're ostensibly what my channel exists to cover, but I don't really have much to say on these ones since they're just run-of-the-mill sci-fi stories with the narrative mainly existing as a way to make English learning interesting. Absolutely no shade on that though. I love it conceptually and can see these being a legit useful learning tool, but even besides that, it's just chill and comfy to relax with an evening with. 
and that could describe a surprising amount of the 3DO's Japanese library. There's more than a handful of games that feel good to just sit down and relax with, both head empty and head not empty. A Tanjo Debut Pure, for instance, requires some level of thought to play, being an idle stat raising sim, but it still feels nice to just kick back, make some schedules, watch numbers go up and down, interact with the cute girls, and hear some adorable voice acting along the way. In a similar vein, there's a handful of board games and quiz games on the platform that might be fun to relax with, though I suck at all of them so I can't comment much. Namely, there's a ton of Mahjong. Anime Mahjong, erotic Mahjong, even live action Mahjong that ties in the manga with Akaki to Python, a jank as fuck but charming title based on a live action film that adapts a manga by the author of Kaiji. On the less finky side though, you got something like Bonogarashi. Originally released on the Macintosh with a planned and canned port to the Pippin of all things, the 3DO ended up getting this game a whole year before the PSX did. It's based on a Yonkoma manga, Bono Bono, and is more or less just a cozy forest exploration sim where you get to wander around, talk to an interactive cute forest friends, and take strolls along crayon environments while music plays and your character hums in rhythm with their steps. Comfy, vibey, simple. It feels like a predecessor to the whole wholesome game genre, albeit without any of the posturing about that genre somehow being greater than others. I also don't know if I'd call this particularly great, mostly because interaction feels a bit clumsy, and the lack of any goals besides exploration makes the experience feel aimless without the quirkiness of something like Life Stage to compensate. If that said, it's mostly an educational tool for teaching kids verbs in a relaxing world to explore, and I know I'm not the audience for that. I just appreciate it as a thing to boot up every now and then to show to friends, spend 10 minutes exploring a cute little world, and then come away feeling part of my soul healed, though I think watching Godone play the game is overall a more fun experience. Also, for kids, we're a couple episodes of Grimu Mei Sakugekijo, a somewhat well-known series of fairy tale adaptations that, long before it got picked up by Discotech in 2020, had a couple of episodes released for 3DO compatible players. I actually don't have much to say about these, I just think obscure anime releases like this are cool, and a great show of how people really wanted the 3DO to be more of a game system. That includes people such as the developers of Aqua World, Umibi Monogatari, a game all about fish. You can swim around as fish with your fish friends, watch fish videos, consume fish media, and learn about fish facts, all with an extremely elegaic and uncanny aura to it. The fuck weird 3D CG models, the slight glitchiness, the simplistic loading screens, and the music underlining it all that borders on coming out of Silent Hill for no good reason really creates a special atmosphere. Which, eh, speaking of creepy things, the 3DO doesn't have many games in the horror genre on it, but it's a quality over quantity thing. There's maybe seven in the entire library of 251 titles, two of which are exclusive to Japan. If fans of obscure games are mousing over video timelines, probably already know which one is getting extensive coverage, but it's worth noting the other one because I think it's pretty cool, Gurokishi no Kamen, developed by Hummingbird Soft, yet another Japanese PC dev alumni like Microcabin who couldn't resist hopping on the 3DO train. The second in their million-selling Ghost Hunter series of dungeon crawlers, Falling it Pedasu no Ma, and Proceeding Parake Resusu no Maken, it sees you taking on the role of a party of ghost hunters making their way through the haunted mansion of the long-deceased Guildford family in London, attempting to solve the evil mysteries they left behind, with a little dash of Lovecraft inspiration for Spice. Of all the games I played for this video, this is easily one of the most engrossing. I only went for the first hour or so, but there's a legit sense of mystery as you go around exploring the place, fighting monsters, finding items, and enjoying the 3D, CG, and FMV environments loading in with each step, sometimes with real actors placed inside of them to keep the plot moving along. Real actors that seem to be speaking English and got dubbed over, which makes me wonder why this never made it to North American shelves. The FMVs give the title a very unique and distinctly 90s aesthetic for sure, but they've got some superbly good vibes, and I'm guessing there's some technical reason given that the game was originally meant to use 3D rendered environments. A fact that seemed to be buried for a very long time given that these builds never got leaked or anything, relegated to screenshots and early issues of the official Japanese 3 do magazine. I have issue 0 here, which I sent off to Game Alexander to be preserved in the midst of working on my last video, but you can pretty clearly see the full screen, crispy, 3D environments before they got prettied up and condensed down to a bunch of FMVs. In some ways, it feels like a missed opportunity as the 3DO doesn't have nearly enough games that lean in heavy on the 3D part of the console, but I also adore this look, so I'm not exactly phased. The only thing I could complain about is the overall slow pace. Videos of movement got a load, object interaction is slow, and everything besides the combat feels like it's going at too much of a leisurely stroll. It adds to the tense atmosphere since you are physically locked 
dropped by the speed of video playback to take your time exploring, but it can also make trying to find a key object feel 100 times more tedious. The combat is pretty cool though. It's switching between self-defense, using guns, casting magic, and consuming items. It's basic but works well for the dungeon crawling style. It's honestly disappointing this game never got released here, though I do sort of understand why. It's got crap tons of voice acting that need to be re-recorded and dubbed, even discounting the aforementioned FMVs, and a ton of text besides that when exploring rooms, reading books, using items. I can imagine it also being a headache now for fan translators because a lot of the game is not subtitled frustratingly, requiring both extensive hacking work and to find new VAs. Still though, game's good if you know Japanese, and it's historically pretty neat, being part of a beloved series that never got much rep out here. The most recognition Ghost Hunter ever had in the West was of a fan translation of La Pedas No Ma on the Super Famicom, which changed the gameplay from first-person dungeon crawling to top-down RPGing. Not to say that's a bad thing, but it's definitely different from everything else in the franchise. Sadly though, I don't have a ton of faith this game in particular will make it into English. is not exactly a huge system in any retro gaming community, partly due to the unfairly mediocre reputation it's garnered over the years, so there's very little interest in getting anything on it in English. That said, there have been two translations. One's of a South Korea exclusive tactical RPG named Battle Blues, which I considered covering for this video, but fangs are long enough as is. Though Jeremy Nicola and Hyun Byun both deserve big respects for making a piece of gaming history more accessible. The other TL, though, is of a game that I would consider the best horror game on the platform, Dr. Motherfucking Hauser. River Hill Soft's a name that might sound familiar to people watching this channel. Dudes come up everywhere you look, from porting Ogre Battle and Tactics Ogre to the Saturn and developing a JB Herald series of murder mysteries, to their alumni showing up in little spots all over gaming. One of the programmers of this title, for instance, Akihiro Hino, later went on to produce the first Layton game, among many others, and the Polycon designer was a part of the Dot Hack graphics staff, as well as doing visual artistry on Soto Torobo, one of my favorite games ever. Hell, even my video on Black Sykes Core Screaming Show for December, I found that one of the sound designers did the incredible soundtrack for that game, who coincidentally also happens to be a sounds person on Overblood, another Riverhill soft game that builds heavily off the foundation of Dr. Hauser. I never played that one, so I don't know how it is, but knowing even a tie as thin as the flexible glass on my flip phone exists between these two made me even more excited to check it out. And hey, it didn't disappoint. Hauser is a fantastic game by an often overlooked studio, filled with incredible ideas that exemplify why the 3 do is so damn cool to me. A survival horror game with full 3D environments, gameplay mechanics that feel fresh, linear progression that's as tight and compact as demo scene code, stock music perfectly chosen to fit the environments, and a story all about a dude who just really loved his wife and the man who has to pick up the pieces. If people often compare this game to Alone in the Dark, which is very fair, both our early survival horror titles predating Resident Evil Evil and Silent Hill, set in the mansion of a cold happening, similar game mechanics, fixed camera angles, and a story told for environmental details and left behind items. The difference is in, well, everything else and even in some of those things. I played a chunk of Alone in the Dark for this video, again, after I played it for my Necronomicon video and didn't like it there, and doing so reminded me again why it is that I've always struggled to enjoy it. Enemies that can lock you into spots, clumsy menuing, archaic progression, clunky controls that make playing obnoxious, and the most utterly absurd fucking death traps imaginable all lead to an experience that feels hostile to the player exploring and actually enjoying the title. While Alone in the Dark revels in the crueler trappings of the adventure game genre, Dr. Hauser actively seeks to trim down the bloat that makes a one-hour game take 10 to complete. Progression is linear, inventory management is non-existent, puzzles rely on logic and have hints of plenty, the handful of death traps are mitigated by how entertaining they are in the simplicity of exploration, and the jank combat of Alone in the Dark is all gone. Also unlike Alone in the Dark, which used pre-rendered backgrounds, Dr. Hauser is in full polygonal 3D, leveraging this to allow you to switch between fixed angles, first person, and overhead cameras, all of which are incredibly helpful to puzzle solving and the small bits of platforming present, taking care of the problems of fixed angles obstructing your view of hazards. This was a huge deal at the time, enough for the official 3 do magazine to ask title director Kenichiro Hayashi about it. While polygons make the 3DO sell, the console is not meant for games with fully detailed polygons. One will have to sacrifice development speed and face technical challenges. I decided to ask why they wanted to stick to polygons. If you ever want to make something on the 3DO, the first thing you have to think about is how you would use Cinepak to make seamless 3D computer graphics. This would make it easy to display graphics on the 3DO, but if you look around, especially on the US side, you'll notice how much effort, or rather how much money, they've put in the pre-production. Take Jurassic Park Interactive, its CG pre-production cost a meager 1 million US dollars. Time obviously played a huge factor as well. We can't really compete with them at all. That's why we decided to use another feature the 3DO is famous for, 
polygons, we would be able to challenge that game if we rely on becoming technically proficient. I think this quote is pretty illuminating not only to both the state of the industry at the time, but why the Freedio was revelatory to some developers. It was the first multimedia and gaming platform capable of rendering decent quality 3D without completely breaking the bank if a developer was skilled enough. It was certainly easier to rely on FMV at the powerful Cinepack codec used in countless Mega CD, Freedio, and Saturn games, but one could level that field with mere technical prowess. Granted, most developers didn't feel the need to go through the same extreme that River Hillsoft did. Games like Shockwave by Electronic Arts and Scramble Culver by B-Grade King's Genki seemed pretty content on cutting corners with things like skyboxes, environmental details, sprites, and rendering window sizes, allowing them to run at what feel like solid frame rates for the time without terribly impacting the visual quality. But River Hill Soft was not satisfied with that. Everything, with only one or two exceptions from books to floods of water, are rendered with polygons, with a respectable level of texture and model detail even if it does look like a 3D movie maker sketch half the time. Hell, even the face of Adam is animated in full 3D, which looks dorky now but was admirable then. It's even got a little bit of a cel-shaded feel to it, long predicting that style's modern popularity. The downside to this impressive tech, however, is that the game runs very poorly. It almost never manages to hit even 15 frames per second, instead constantly dipping into single digits. But given that the game has no combat and instead opts for gameplay exclusively being the player examining environments carefully and thoughtfully, there's never a point in my mind where some delay in the controller or some slowdown feels like it's impeding your ability to function. On top of that, progress is always brisk. You're never stuck in one place for too long or forced to do plenty of backtracking. Instead, each room or couple of rooms operate as their own individual puzzles in a way. Solve one of those and you move on to the next without enough running around for the slowdown to inhibit the pace of progress. And plus, there's something weirdly satisfying about learning how to change camera angles to optimize the frame rate, flipping between the free as required to get a level of performance satisfactory for that moment. I fucking dig the whole feel of this game, but there's something engaging about exploring a creepy old mansion not threatened by enemies in combat as you slowly piece together an underlying narrative about an archaeologist who lost control of his life, starting out with vibes similar to HP Lovecraft's Rats in the Wall, before going off the rails by the end in a satisfying climax that tidies up a two or so hour long first playthrough with a cute little bow that explodes into chunky polygons. Nice graphics! Also, I gotta mention the translation and its quality. The game's always had a little bit of notoriety here as an import title back in the day, but that quote falling exploded with the force of the tiniest firecracker thanks to Snowy Aria working her magic, hacking and translating the whole thing for the Freedio community to experience. She even made a version of the game that has a custom soundtrack since the stock music gets claimed like wild. Unlike the quality of the TL, it's great and faithful to the source material. It's simply put, game good. The shortness of the adventure and the pace of it all feels far more reminiscent of a modern RPG Maker game than it does a classic adventure title. Compact, concise, and tidy, never overstaying its welcome, but never feeling like anything is cut short. A pace that feels slow and deliberate, yet in constant motion. After I finished the game and started doing more research for this video, I was kind of surprised to learn that a lot of import reviews of the time and even now had been critical of the game because it's too slow, it's too short, it doesn't have enough or good enough puzzles. And all I can say is just, man! I know mainstream Western games journalism has never exactly been great, doubly so in the 90s and early 2000s. One only has to look at the absolute hot steaming garbage written about games like Symphony of the Night, or the bizarro xenophobia, transphobia, homophobia, sexism, and racism towards anything that's too Japanese or some bullshit like that. And we all know who will replace us, India. Whoa, 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 hold the fuck up. But it's kind of wild to see things that were seen as flaws back then in many ways are now big glowing positives to people, including myself. Bite-sized games you can digest in a short time and feel satisfied with that don't require immense amounts of struggling of arcane puzzles, that are laser-focused on delivering a couple things in their experience, are the kind of titles I open this video praising for a good reason. I have the attention span of a small rodent, so if your long 50-hour game doesn't immediately grip me and keep the hamster in my brain spinning her wheels with great story, engaging gameplay loops, and art that appeals to my sensibilities, or isn't the right kind of soulful mid or bad that makes me feel the love of the devs behind it, then I'd rather play something tiny that engages me for as long as it recently can and disappears with a bang. Dr. Hauser is exactly that. It's got a nice lamp, it's paced just as it has to be, and every single thing I feel I could have gotten from its exploration-focused proto-survival horror full 3D scruckle fest design, I got so without any fatigue. Hell, Silent Hill man Keiichiro Toyama himself said it influenced him a lot, so it's not as if the game is without historical merit beyond being the first real-time full 3D survival horror title either. Even removing that real-time qualifier, it still predates games like Warp's 1995 FMV horror classic D, a far more famous 
title due to getting ported to every other major system at the time afterwards. PSX, Saturn, PC. It's also notable for the, uh, cannibalism that got snuck into the game at the last minute with no publisher awareness after Anal decided it wasn't dark enough. Getting to play this game for this video is kind of wish fulfillment for me in a way, since I've always wanted to check it out after hearing about it sometime in the late 2000s. I tempered my expectations going into this and ended up having a great time. The story is simple but intriguing, the atmosphere is hella spooky, and the gameplay is simple, fun FMV adventure affair for the most part. The puzzle design is definitely a lot less sensible than that of Dr. Hauser, and things can feel obfuscated exclusively to be fucking annoying. And see the time-wasting rotato room on disc 2. But there's a charm you aren't gonna find in any other game. Also, stairs! A whole fuck ton of stairs! Oh my god, is that a Patreon bumper at the top of those stairs? That's spooky. It's that time of the video again, friends, for life updates, Patreon Q&As, and whatever else I can squeeze into here. On the first most front, there isn't too much to add over last month's edition of this segment. Things have mostly been okay, I've been taking care of my mental health and it's gotten a lot better, and I'm still learning how to budget with a now stable income. We've broken 900 a month, which is impossibly fucking awesome. Thank you all so, so much. It warms my heart to see people enjoying my content this much and being willing to support it like this, both in the financial sense and in all the kind comments, the likes, the subs, and by sharing these things around. We already broke 10k on the barcode fighter video, that's incredible! It's... it makes me really damn happy. Thank you everyone. And as per usual, I want to try and give back a bit by shouting out channels and people that I think are cool and deserve your support. It'll be just two this time since I want to keep things short to focus on the Patreon Q&A, but there are a great two things. The first is Video Game Esoterica, a channel I've been wanting to shout out now for a long time, and this is a better time than ever given that he's pretty much the premier free do dude on YouTube in my book. His channel has an incredible wealth of information on retro gaming in general, with a ton in specific on the odd successor to this console, the M2. But he's also got plenty of videos on forgotten arcade games, emulation tech, and many tutorials, including one that really helped me set up the ODE I got. Definitely check him out and support him if any of that is your jam. He's a cool dude and he does good work. The second is Hobbit Optimist, a newcomer to making video essays that's already off to an amazing start with his work covering the SMT Devil Survivor titles. His video on the second in particular is a well-structured, well-put-together critique of the game that's made me really want to check out the title and maybe get into SMT as a whole. And being new to the scene, he's got barely any views and barely any subs, so if you got some time to spare, then check his stuff out and show him some support. Because God knows the algorithm sucks if people just starting out and his work is way too good to get buried by it. With that said, and hopefully added to y'all's watch later lists, I'd like to take some time to answer Patreon Q&As, because there were a lot this month and a lot of really cool ones. Starting with France's question. There's quite a lot of Dojin fighting games made around the 90s and aughts, stuff like Moonlight's 2 or Alasenki. Would you ever be interested in taking a look at one of these? Definitely, I'd like to do a video someday looking broadly at Dojin fighters based on VN's and Edo Gay. Particularly, Alice Sinki is a neat one as mentioned, as well as the original Melty Blood Eternal Fighter Zero. It's a cool scene I'd love to talk more about someday, especially once you start diving into Fighter Maker games, which are just a fucking incredible rabbit hole. Shout out to my homie Arm Joe. Sarah Denman asks, Question, favorite Western VN's, and how do you feel it compares to the Japanese output? So, I don't typically play a lot of English VNs, mostly because I don't play a lot of English games these days outside of for videos, but I did check out some for this video and have some recommendations from friends that I can say look pretty cool. Queen Beast, Lookout, Echo, really anything Ibihimi has made. As for how it compares to the Japanese output, I think there's a lot less defining and huge titles just because the Western industry is less established, but it's definitely quite good and a lot better than some people make it out to be. The local weeb asks, Question, what are your opinions on Nitro Plus? They made lesbian cyberpunk B-movie horror and one of my favorite horror games ever, so they're pretty sweet in my book. Also, a lot of really cool gay-as-fuck games. Uh, I'll do a video on slow damage someday. I really want to talk about that game, it seems sweet. Some Spoonie Bard asks, favorite Falcom track? Or if that's too hard, favorite Falcom OST? Uh, so my favorite is probably. Not definitively, but probably, because having a definitive favorite with Falcom is impossible. The Valley of Quicksand from Dawn of Ease. And my favorite OST is absolutely Dawn. That game is 10 out of 10 Kino, and the soundtrack even more so. Dana CWSF asks, What is one game, or free if you can't pick, slash VN, that you'll probably never cover in a channel, but everyone watches you should try? 
Thunder Force 4, Marathon Trilogy, and Ease Open Folk Honor are all very Noel core games that everyone needs to experience at least once in their lives. I know I sort of cheated with that second title because it's actually free games, but I mean if I said play one game out of the series of free with intricately linked stories, that'd be a bit silly. Like, I think Marathon Infinity is by far the best of the free, it's also the fucking weirdest, but that game makes no sense if you haven't played the other two. And that about wraps up all the questions, and most of this segment, but again, Thank you to everyone who donates, thank you everyone who shares these videos, watches them, likes, leaves kind comments. It all means the world to me and I wouldn't be here without your support. Literally, this is my job now, it's how I make a living, it's the most stable living I've ever had and I love doing it. It always makes me feel accomplished when I complete one more video and see people genuinely happy to hear about these things, and even if this one is kind of different from the norm, I hope it's been fun so far and continues to be. If you want to help support content like this and everything else I do, ask me questions, see content early and without censors, get your name on the screen and more, then consider supporting me monthly on Patreon. Just one buck gives you every benefit, but if you'd rather leave me something one time on Kofi, you can do that as well. Absolutely no shame in that. And if you can't or don't want to donate, that's completely fine. Just watching my comment, sharing it, and engaging with it does a ton for me. I have no intentions to ever gate anything outside of uncensored videos because I can't post those to YouTube anyway, so you're not missing out on a whole ton if you choose not to donate. Thank you all so much as always, and back to the show. Hey, wait, isn't that the dad of the main character of D? Yeah, so something I haven't seen anyone mention online is that another one of Warp's games has possibly canonical ties to D. And that game is Space Hoodlepon, a shoot 'em up where you set out to conquer and colonize the stars as a bunch of cute little dudes. The game doesn't have much to do with D, but hey, there's Richter Harris. I've seen a lot of people say over the years that Fridio doesn't have any 2D shmups, which I guess was pervasive as a myth due to the fact that this game is tucked away on the Fudopon world, a mini-game compilation disc that otherwise contains nothing but puzzle titles. This game is real rough though. The controls are jank as hell, the difficulty is absurdly high, and the whole experience feels very much like an unfinished game jam demo of a much better final game. Really, the only thing notable about it is that the Game Facts forum got co-opted by furries for at least seven years, with a whole subculture unique to the Fudopon world board. There isn't really much to add to that, I just kind of admire the tenacity of up and yeeting a whole obscure game board for the sake of building a community, and some people of which didn't even know what a fucking Fridio was, they just showed up for the ride. I, more, more on topic though, I admire the energy this game's got. The sprites are cute, the music is fun, and it's got that overwhelming off-kilter atmosphere that Anno's games are known for. A dude really had a style all his own that we're sorely missing with his passing over a decade ago, and I think it kind of embodies what the Freedio is. He was one of those devs drawn to the freedom of the platform and had a lot of admiration for what the company was doing, especially Trip Hawkins and his desire to make not just game development, but interactive media development as a whole more accessible for all with a platform to go with it. Even if that accessibility and lack of caring on part of the Freedio company might have resulted in some games that are mediocre as hell, it also made people feel like they could create. I don't know if D and all the other countless titles with a similarly rogue and experimental style could have been dreamed up without the freedom. Take Knob, for instance, a dungeon crawling tactical fighting game that boggles my brain to try and figure out, but it's got this grody as fuck look that reminds me of games like Cruelty Scott and Hylix, and eh, it just tickles a part of my brain. It's also one of only four games that Sanyo published on the platform, the other three being a baseball game I wasn't too invested in, a bomberman ish game where you try and flush out opponents by getting them caught up in tides of water, and Dragon Tycoon Edge, an RPG. I could not fucking figure out for the life of me, but also has that surreal aesthetic that feels in line with modern bizarro indie games. Maybe if it were in English or had subtitles, it would be easier, but as it is in JP of such a chaotic atmosphere with voices only, I just found myself lost, admiring the looks more than anything. Compared to other console manufacturers, Sanyo was pretty hands-off with involving themselves on the software side of things. OG made a bit more of an effort by actually developing a few games for the small South Korean 3 market, like the weird on-rail space shooter Armageddon and the aforementioned Battle Blues, but Panasonic was really the only one that pushed very hard with assisting developers. It makes sense too, since as I mentioned before, Fridio Company just licensed out the hardware and got a few bucks per game and console. It was up to the companies to turn a profit on manufacturing purely for moving systems, and with Panasonic being by far the largest manufacturer of Fridio tech, getting involved in game dev was a way to potentially boost system sales by cutting costs if the game sales turned enough of a profit to compensate. Just to name a few, they published a D as well as the Port of Mist in the US, Scramble Cobra, Starblade, Lucian's Quest, and Burning Soldier, one of many FMV titles on the system and my personal favorite. 
favorite. This is kind of the equivalent of video game junk food, but there's something seriously cozy about just sitting down, kicking back, and blowing stuff up in a cheapo FMV environment of cheesy, banging music running the whole way. Much as I'll vouch for the system containing far more than just these kinds of games, I think those simple action experiences are by far and away what the 3DO is most remembered for in English spaces, helped by the fact that it's practically all Western developers were making. Which isn't to say I dislike those, I got a soft spot for more than a few. Total Eclipse and Escape from Monster Manor are some of my favorites on the system, as is Gex contrary to the general opinion on that one. People tend to say this game sucks, but you know what? Fuck that noise, we respect the gecko here. Still though, much as I have fun with those, my preferences happen to lie off the artsy titles and the more chill experiences, like the OG NFS published by EA and, surprisingly, brought over to Japan like most of their 3DO lineup. It's got a unique feel to other racing games of the time and even later on with the hefty handling, lack of music, and rather leisurely yet still engrossing pace. The cruising, coasting, enjoying the sights while your disc drive goes wild streaming the track on the fly off the CD, or USB in my case. It's by far the best 3DO racing game even if a shocking amount of competition. Autobahn Tokyo may or may not be part of that competition. It's the singular game that Sonai Enterprise developed before vanishing into the wind, with seemingly nothing else known about them outside of his jank-ass Daytona clone they created. One that runs at 10 FPS constantly, has absurdly simple geometry, and fuckly handling. It feels like a lot of love and soul went into this, but maybe not in the places it needed it? I don't know, I really can't hate on this one too much, it's kind of cute. Like I've said, the 3DO was a big experimental platform for people in an era where no one knew how to use 3D well. Everyone was winging it and some people were just going to wing it less well, especially the small time studios who had ambitions to create fast quality arcade titles like this. It's still memorable just for being a game by a couple of dudes who wanted to make something cool that unapologetically mimics the games they love. That has its own place in gaming history even if it's hard to talk about or go into much depth on compared to the quirkier stuff. The games that don't feel like they'd be at home on PSX nor PC exactly, games that exist purely out of ambition for something new. I think most exclusives I've talked about so far have that kind of vibe, and even the ones that only came out on 3 do first feel like they wouldn't have arrived on other consoles had this platform not provided an opportunity for the developers to put their work out in the first place. I doubt D would have existed without Kane Giano being invested in the entrepreneurial spirit of the 3DO company, nor would LifeStage have existed without the freedom to create software that can't be cleanly categorized as game or education. All of those and everything else I've talked about and many more feel perfectly at home on 3DO, a system for anything and everything, and anyone and everyone, whether that was some group established as important or beloved in the gaming scene or or Niche's hard H heck devs deciding to make a virtual multimedia archive of 90s hacker, tech otaku, and zine culture. Very specific case in point, Deino Hyoryu Multimedia Cruising. This title came out in a very precarious time for tech history, with the year of its release, 1995, being the year the internet finally hit mainstream success. Quoting from the webzine screen slate, the groundwork for the interconnected global computer networks was laid in the 1960s, but it didn't capture the public imagination until the mid-1990s, at which time a confluence of fact including the release of Netscape Navigator, the Windows 95 operating system, high-profile hacking arrests, and aggressive direct marketing campaigns by commercial service providers AOL, CompuServe, and Prodigy, fast-tracked the information superhighway for the mainstream traffic. Once a domain of scientists, hobbyists, hackers, and role-playing gamers, the internet had irreversibly broken into the public imagination. Multimedia cruising is, in a lot of ways, a snapshot of that former domain as the internet was drifting away from it, compiling an immense amount of info on computer history, websites, interviews, photos, albums, short clips, posters, zines, cosplays, and more into one singular place with an incredible breadth of expository information, all sorted in a way that's as easy to navigate as it is fun. All of the content is organized into 11 areas you can move freely between, referred to as pools, each containing plates of a couple types within. Information, movie, still, sound, and book, which you interface with by bumping into while floating around in cyberspace. It's mechanically very simple and intuitive and doesn't really need to be anything more since the title is all about exploration and learning rather than visceral action. It's also, um, very eclectic aesthetically. Every zone looks wildly different from the last, many utilizing bright neon colors of objects floating around everywhere and walls rotating around you. It's a unique over-the-top look that I think perfectly symbolizes the chaos of the early internet. It's all disconnected and disjointed, but it still makes enough sense to track as you fly around to learn about an era long gone.
The amount of info covered overall is genuinely astounding and paints a strong picture of how quickly culture was growing at that time. It seems like Mondo 2000, the early days of digital journalism with sites like Hotwired, digital currencies like Digicash, interviews of various figures, music samples, cosplay photos, concert advertisements, computer parts info, and much of it goes far beyond the mainstream. They could have just talked to famous musicians for instance, but a lot of artists chosen just seem to be people the creators liked. Some are notable like Zavon Theft, but then you get other like the band Air Liquid or the label Silent Records, painting as diverse a picture of each subject as is possible without being shy to get into the deep ends of culture. Because of this, it feels like a far more complete and real archive than a lot of modern recollections of tech history. It's not just what people remember now, it's not just the successes, it's the culture as it was at the time with picks specific to the tastes of developers, who they could talk to and what they could find, which makes playing this feel seriously like being immersed in the era as opposed to merely observing it. This also leads to a lot of really cool info that people don't talk about being laid out bare for the player. In the VR world, for instance, you get to hear about forgotten early systems, demonstrations at tech shows, and hacky homebrew solutions from people who were there at the time, like Linda Jacobson, a self-described VR evangelist who regularly talked about the capabilities of it for art and expressions. I especially love this excerpt from an interview that isn't in this game, but I found online when looking for info about her. What is real important to me is the notion that everybody is an artist. Sure, some people are born with more innate talent than others, but everyone is able to express ideas and emotions artistically. It's important to me that VR attain its lofty status as an artist tool, an artistic medium, one that will allow the viewer or participant to become co-creator in the art. That alone affects our self-identity. With VR, you're no longer just a consumer. This is the kind of culture this CD archives and it's what makes it so brilliant. Anything and everything is given equal footing regardless of how important it would end up being because it all made up the communities of the day. You wanna know about discs on crop circles? It's there. Wanna look at old hacker fashion? You can do that. Interested in contemporary art about and sometimes made on computers in the late 80s and early 90s? That's here too. The disc has a very international feeling to it as well. One might expect it to just be limited to Japanese and maybe US tech culture, but there's videos of conferences from Hungary, artists from Sweden, hackers from the US, musicians from Japan. Whoever and wherever had a tech scene that they had access to showing was fair game to be put in here to show how diverse this time was. Diverse applies to the kinds of people shown too. You have people working in companies and working in basements, women are rightfully given a space as the pioneers in tech they've always been, and there's an overall sense that the developers truly believe that tech is by and for everybody, not just the corporate suits who like to take all the credit. It's also shockingly accessible without knowing Japanese since most of the audio is in English with Japanese subs and you can look up names and tech on your phone in place of being able to read the info plates, though some of it is hard to find now. The only part that gets vaguely challenging are the quizzes that are thrown at you at specific points in the game which give you items called miracle balls. And once you've collected all six, you can go up to a forbidden 12th area that's hyped up as containing information about the prior generation of the internet. Though this is not true at all. Upon unlocking the last gate, a cutscene plays out, you get the quiz bunny lady saying, oh well, too bad, and the area closes off for good. I'm fairly confident this whole bit was just a way to get players to explore more of the game, and while that's clever, it's also disappointing as I would have liked to see some BBS era content archived here. I did want to make 100% sure I wasn't missing anything though, so I took a peek through the files of the game, and yeah, unless I am still missing something, there's nothing here of the sort far as I can see. At the very least, it's not as if the game is lacking in content as it is. It took me around two and a half hours to see the majority of it and complete the story, which may not sound like much, but I think it's another good example of a title not overstaying its welcome. You come here, learn about what you want to learn about, and leave a more curious and knowledgeable person, maybe with a drive to boot up the title every once in a while to see something you didn't before. But above all, what I think is most interesting about this game is the sheer passion present in so much of the art presented and people interviewed. The game was made at a time where many people were really genuinely hopeful for the future of technology, an era where anything and everything seemed possible, where everyone could create something new and brilliant. From homebrew VR to experimental electronica, from 3D modeling to early MMOs, from hacker fashion to digital zines, this game embodies what makes the 90s and tech so fascinating to look back on, and in a way, I think this bold display of enthusiasm embodies why I love the 3 so much. It was freedom. 
I think there's a unique kind of pessimism towards tech these days that didn't exist before. And let me be clear, that pessimism is completely fucking deserved. After all, we're past the days of a decade taking us from 40 megahertz to 1 gigahertz CPUs, and the days of mediums radically shifting due to new storage and techniques and unlocking new technical frontiers. We're living in a days where graphical advancements are more impressive to stockholders and artists, machine learning is being used to fabricate information, and nearly everyone wants to sell your data. These things and many others are important to be aware of, and I don't want to play down how fucked things are in many ways. But within all of the guff and all the awful things happening, there's something very important that I don't think gets acknowledged nearly enough. And that's the accessibility of art, how easy it's become to share something with your friends, your family, even the world. In the 90s, there weren't many places to do this with any sort of great platform. Sure, you could publish any software on PC, but there is no guarantee PC owners would be able to run it, or that any store would be interested in stocking some random software. You could go to a large console creator, but that costs far more money and put restrictions on your creativity. And with both of these, there's no guarantee you could do everything you wanted. Not every PC could do FMV or 3D, and consoles were often pretty weak, and getting hardware to do more than what they were meant for was expensive. 3DO is one of the first times that PC people with a vision, interested in experimenting of new tech, got a platform that was unrestricted as the PC world, yet gave a voice loud enough to rival other consoles. It let anyone able to afford development hardware and software and manufacture their games and make their wild dreams reality, fostering an environment where people were allowed to do whatever they wanted with as little overhead as possible. And I think that feeling of freedom is important. Even if, say, Nintendo might have been okay with many of the games I talked about here, just knowing that something you put so much hard work into could be rejected an instant is fucking soul-crushing as a creative. Similarly, many games on itch.io, Jest, USA, or any number of alternate platforms could exist on Steam, but there's still that stress of rejection that for many developers, especially LGBT, adult, and Japanese developers or publishers and localizers, becomes reality. But just like the 3D on the 90s, itch.io, and even many other platforms have fostered an environment that welcome your wildest visions with no compromises. And unlike the days of the 3DO, technology has progressed past the point where you need to own a Macintosh computer as a dev kit or to have any programming knowledge. You can create bizarre, off-kilter, and unmarketable games accessible to anyone with a computer just using modern free tools. And maybe without knowing it, that art will resonate with people. The freedom to create without limitation is, well, freeing. And that's why the Fridio sticks with me so much. This mixture of excitement and the lessened financial burden lends a feeling of passion to much of the library that's been echoed in every single interview I've read and watched. Of course, not every single game on this is made with love, and not every single game is a hit, but so many of them feel like the passion project of a handful of people, and so many of them were that. They're experimental, they're weird, they can even be bad, but that's kind of what making art is. It's often messy and flawed, but there's something beautiful about that. Playing everything I did for this video, showing my friends all the games as I was playing them, being excited over how unhinged and creative many of them were, all of it gave me a sense of joy that I haven't felt from any other platform in a long time. And it reminded me why I love making games and developing music. Although I haven't been doing it as much due to focusing on video production, I still very much enjoy composing for games, some of which are seen by a large audience and some of which just sit in a corner of a storefront and are enjoyed by a few people. But no matter how big they are, I enjoy working on them and working with others. It feels good to just sit down and make something. This is a subtle plea to hire me, I have a very diverse skill set and low rates and can do really good game music. Even if it's nothing special, even if no one pays attention to it, I enjoy making it and expressing myself. I enjoy working with other people and sharing ideas, and it feels good to create something and share it with others, knowing there's even a slight chance that the freedom given to me now might allow me to impact someone else far, far away. So if you're an artist, keep creating, keep promoting, and keep enjoying your craft. Expressing yourself is good, and even if you're worried about being bad, it's alright. And if you're a journalist or writer, then maybe consider platforming some lesser-known artists. Make an article on your favorite itch.io games instead of talking about AAA dev drama of the week. Write about cool musicians who haven't hit it big. Blog about illustrators doing amazing work that's seen by few people. We have more tools and platforms than ever to be artists, and we should be promoting those and the people who use them. I feel lucky to exist in a time where there's so many platforms that exist for artists to be creative in whatever niche they're in. And they might all be flawed, but they represent chances to find and create community to share our passions and art with each other and spread our wings with far fewer limitations than ever before. There's something that makes me smile, knowing that we're freer to be artists than ever before. 